I could see a trail of blood, and it just gave me a sinking feeling. I knew right away that this was going to be a, a bad scene. I'd seen suicides. I'd seen people disfigured in auto accidents. This was kind of the over the top. I, I kind of went into right out of the grieving mode into the panic mode of, you know, where are my kids? There was so much anger in it. I mean, he, he just hit like he couldn't kill them enough. He's the boogeyman. He is a smart, intelligent, manipulative killer. A sleepy town known for its rugged beauty. People that come here come here because they love the lakes, they love to fish, they love to hike. Uh, it's a place that makes you feel safe. But on May 16, 2005, Coeur d'Alene loses its innocence in the wake of the most brutal crime the area has ever seen. It's an ordinary Monday afternoon when local police receive a call from a man named Robert Hollingsworth. He's just come from a neighbor's home where he noticed what appears to be bloodstains splattered across the front door. There's blood all over the door. Nobody comes through the door. Not sure what to make of the strange report, the Kootenai County Sheriff's Department dispatches a deputy to check on the residence of Brenda Grumman. She lives with her boyfriend, Mark McKenzie, and her three children, 13-year-old Slade, 9-year-old Dylan, and 8-year-old Shasta. It's a family that Deputy Moyer knows well. You know, I drive by, and, and Dylan and Shasta would come out to the car, and I'd give them Sheriff Deputy stickers, and they wanted to look in the patrol car and see the lights. But the moment he arrives at the Grony home, he can tell that something's not right. It was very calm and still, and there was kind of an a eerie stillness about the residence. And as I walked up to the front door, I saw the blood on the front door. There was a smell and odor that, if you've been in law enforcement long enough, it smells like death. And as I walked around the back and saw a smear on the back door of blood, and the door was ajar, and that initially just sent a chill down my spine. My, my senses kind of went up, and I took a little more precautions. You know, I called for another unit to come back me up. Uh, we walked up to the front door, and I looked into the front door, and I could see a trail of blood. It just gave me a sinking feeling. I knew right away that this was going to be a, a bad scene. Investigators enter the home cautiously with guns drawn. I turned the corner. There was what appeared to be a young male, uh, face down, uh, female, face down. It appeared to be they were bound and, and their heads were uh, mutilated. And then I saw the man. I saw the man laying on the floor. I could see that he, too, uh, had been bludgeoned multiple times in the head and had su suffered severe, severe uh, head trauma. The three bodies were placed one Next, head to toe, head to toe, head to toe. Mark McKenzie, Brenda Groney, Slade Groney, all bludgeoned to death. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, this is a mother. You know, this is, this is a mother who has been tied up and murdered right here along with her own child. And, and how horrific that was. I'd seen suicides. I'd seen people disfigured in auto accidents. This was kind of the over the top. I, really hit home, hit my heart. It's hard for me not to get emotional. You don't prepare for that in law enforcement, but I still had to reach down and say, you know what, I gotta do my job. I I've got kids in this house. As we moved through the house, there was blood stains virtually everywhere in the house, in every single room, on every wall. Officers perform a thorough search of the remaining rooms in the house, including Dylan and Shasta's bedroom. There was blood in there, and 
I just remember thinking, oh no, oh no, not, not the little ones, not the little ones. We began to wonder if possibly if uh, they had met the same fate as the others in the house, their bodies could have been disposed of in another way. But after scouring every corner of the property, the youngest grony children are nowhere to be found. We wondered if possibly that they had fled out into the uh, woods here. I went over to the creek area, which is over here to my left, and called their names out. Jasta, Dylan. I got no response. You get kind of a panic feeling in your heart. Yeah, you know, we have mountain lions and all kinds of different critters running around here. I wouldn't want my little ones out there. But an initial search of the surrounding area turns up no sign of the missing kids. With nightfall fast approaching, investigators know they're going to need all the help they can get. So the county sheriff reaches out to the Coeur d'Alene Division of the FBI. Our first motivation was we now had two missing children. That changes the game. And that's when we really start activating resources, additional agents. The first clue that jumped to mind is where the kids staying with their father. And that was the first door we knocked on. But Steve Groney seems as shocked and puzzled as everyone else. You know, that I obviously had one dead child. I knew that there were two missing. And uh, that just changed the aspect of everything. I, I kind of went into right out of the grieving mode, into the panic mode of, you know, where are my kids? We checked with friends, relatives, any place where they could have been staying. After we exhausted all of those possibilities and they were nowhere to be found, we were very concerned that we had an abduction. Law enforcement immediately puts out an Amber Alert informing the public to be on the lookout for the missing children. The community of Coeur d'Alene joined together and united in a way I've never seen before because they wanted to find Shasta and they wanted to find Dylan. As searchers continue to comb through the surrounding woods, crime scene technicians process the scene. But despite the seemingly frenzied nature of the crime, the killer or killers seem to have covered their tracks perfectly, leaving no clues as to Shasta or Dylan's whereabouts. Dead if they're not found within the first 24 to 48 hours, they generally are found dead. I think actually the more time went by and they weren't finding the bodies that I actually had more hope that they were alive somewhere. The day after Mark McKenzie, Brenda Groney, and her son Slade are brutally slain in their own home, investigators in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, are painfully short on evidence. And more importantly, have no clue as to the whereabouts of the family's youngest two children. We were organized around one common goal, and that was finding Dylan and Shasta. With a killer or killers on the loose, and two youngsters gone without a trace, local residents are scared to death. There was a fear factor that, that permeated the community. Uh, disbelief that, that a crime of this horrific nature could have occurred in this community, this peaceful community, this, this idyllic community. And, uh, a lot of the, the members of the community were, were very um, adversely affected by all this. But until they generate some leads, there's nothing law enforcement can do to quell the town's panic. And so far, they've got almost nothing to go on. In a murder case where you've got a fingerprint on the door, you've got a bloody shoe print, or you've got a witness, you've got something to work on. In this case, we didn't have any of that. We didn't have anything to work with. So the best thing we could do is learn as much as we could about our victims. Brenda and Mark had been dating for about seven years. And they had a great relationship. Mark commuted every day to a manufacturing job in Spokane, 40 miles away. And Brenda had recently given up her cleaning business to be a stay-at-home mom. They seemed to be a picture-perfect couple, but there was a wild side to them as well. Friend and Mark were known to be partiers. Uh, they wanted to have a good time. They had that side of them that, uh, that enjoyed to you know, have a beer or two or a few other things. Still, by all accounts, they seemed to be living a happy and comfortable life. Mark was a, a great guy, and he loved those kids. 
They weren't his kids, but he loved them, and he took very good care of them. And this is what, why we can't understand why this happened. Investigators agree, and based on the brutality of the crime, they begin to piece together a preliminary profile of the killer. And when you see multiple, multiple impact injuries like that, such violence uh, committed on, upon a person, we're taught that that's a personal, that's a personal killing. Oftentimes that's done by somebody who knows the family, somebody that is, that is filled with a lot of anger towards those people. But agents struggle to make sense of the kidnapping. Why would you take the kids out of the house, kill the parents to do so? Why wouldn't you take them at a bus stop? Why wouldn't you take them when they're walking to school? So it appeared to be some kind of a revenge motive, um, someone that was close to the family, someone that wanted to get personal, up close and personal to the, to the victims. As the desperate search for Dylan and Shasta goes national, federal, state, and local officials join forces to start questioning potential suspects. One of the first leads we looked at is that father and mother were divorced, father had a separate residence. We had received allegations that there was a volatile relationship that had existed between Steve and Brenda. And so we naturally would have to rule Steve out before you know, we could move on to some other things. Steve also admits that just two days prior to the murders, he and Brenda had a blowout over the kids. Steve and Brenda have had a hard time having a workable relationship after the divorce. We were aware of some ill will that, that existed between them pertaining to child custody as well as some property issues. Then, a televised plea by Steve raises even more eyebrows. Please release my children safely. They had nothing to do with any of this. Everyone that was out there, part of the, the media and, and even law enforcement, were shocked because the statement, they had nothing to do with this. Well, what is this? Investigators administer a polygraph test to Steve and record a strange fluctuation when they ask him if he knows where his children are. And because of that, we did have to uh, continue uh, to, to look into his activities and basically to make sure that there wasn't anything that we'd missed along the way. Groney insists that he was home alone on the night of the murders. At first, investigators are dubious, but what they find next changes their minds. Police were able to kind of look at the cell phone records and my computer records and know that, that I was actually at home on a computer or on my phone. But it isn't long before suspicion falls on another set of family members. Steve and Brenda also have two adult sons, Jesse and Vance, and both have had their share of run-ins with the law. My two oldest boys have, you know, have been in quite a lot of trouble since they were in their early teenage years. Um, a lot of people make reference to their drug problems and stuff like that. Authorities soon discover that Jesse has an airtight alibi, having been incarcerated on burglary charges when the murders took place. Investigators then interrogate Vance and come away convinced he had no involvement either. But questions remain about a possible motive for the killings. We began to uh, get some tips about uh, a barbecue that occurred the, the day prior to the, uh, the killings. So the cops started looking at everyone that was at the barbecue. Did somebody get in a fight? Did somebody owe somebody money? Was there something else that happened that would have made someone at that barbecue turn around and say, I'm going after these guys the next day? We found a fingerprint on the same door that was bloodstained uh, there at the scene. Uh, that fingerprint returned to an individual uh, who we were aware had attended uh, the gathering the, the previous day. His name is Gary Youngwood, and police soon discover he has a criminal record. According to Jesse Groney, Youngwood also owed his mother and Mark $2,000. 
there was the hope that, that this person would, would lead to the resolution of the crime, to find out what had happened to the kids. Either, either this person may have witnessed something that could help us solve the case, or maybe the person themselves were involved in some way in the crime. But when members of the task force try to locate him for questioning, Youngwood is missing in action. He was difficult to find. Uh, we did uh, serve some search warrants uh, on his cell phone. We began to track him by cell phone. There was a, a considerable amount of resources that were spent in locating this person and in discovering what it is that he knew. A follow-up call to Youngwood's parole officer reveals that the day after Brenda Groney, Slade Groney, and Mark McKenzie were bludgeoned to death, Youngwood notified her that he was leaving town for a short vacation in Boise. One of the thoughts is that he is he's avoiding contact with us because he knows something. The FBI is exploring a new technique called brain fingerprinting that is designed to establish whether or not a person has knowledge of a crime by recording the brain's response to images flashed on a computer screen. Some believe brain fingerprinting may someday be used like lie detector tests in criminal investigations. Nearly 48 hours after the triple murder in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, law enforcement is working hard to track down Gary Youngwood, whose fingerprints were found on the victim's bloody front door. He had contacted his uh, probation officer, and at that point she told him, well, you know, the police are looking to interview you about the murders, and uh, so he did come back, I believe, on his own. Investigators grill Youngwood for hours, but he denies having anything to do with the murders or Shasta and Dylan's disappearance, and he offers to take a lie detector test to prove it. He passed his polygraph, so it, it was apparent to us fairly quickly that although he was a person of interest at the time, we pretty much washed him out of any involvement and any knowledge of the crime. Having ruled out the most obvious suspects, investigators turned their attention to the thousands of tips pouring into the crime hotline. One allegation was that this was a biker hit, and so we started looking at biker gangs. Maybe there was some sort of vendetta that existed. Maybe there was money owed. Maybe, you know, somebody insulted someone else's girlfriend. Who knows? And when the medical examiner identifies the murder weapon, it gives the biker gang theory even more credence. The weapon used to bludgeon the victims appeared to be a hammer with a cross-hatched face on it. And that is the sort of hammer that you would find as a, as a framing hammer or as a drywall hammer. Some gang expert threw out the fact, well, you know, if they were killed with a hammer, that sounds like outlaw bikers. Was this a biker gang that rolled through town? We just didn't know. Brenda Groney was into motorcycles. So when we started getting these allegations of a potential biker hit, um, it, you know, it made a little bit of sense to us. But investigators can't link any particular biker gang to the scene. And it doesn't make sense that they would take the children, who have now been missing for almost three days. I never gave up hope that we would get the children back in this case. Uh, statistically, however, uh, in child abduction cases, uh, it is very unusual. Uh, more often than not, these cases end up uh, in a sad way. Those hopes are bolstered, however, when results of the FBI's blood analysis return from the lab. Not a single drop of blood at the crime scene belongs to Dylan or Shasta. When the lab results came back and we determined that the blood was Slade's blood throughout the house, we were relieved to know that the kids might possibly still be alive somewhere. But even the most hardened investigators are shaken when they learn how 13-year-old Slade's blood got spread throughout the house. I know that that was personally very traumatic for me to think that Slade was walking through the house injured and leaving a trail of blood throughout the entire house, every, through every room of the house, and then finally dying at his mother's feet. 
Investigators are now confident that the children were not murdered with the rest of their family. Now we knew that the children were, had somehow either left the house on their own or been removed from the house, and there was no evidence to suggest that they had been killed in the house. We believe that they were alive somewhere, and there was nothing that we would stop at doing in an effort to find them. Then, on May 20th, just four days after the murders, there's another twist in the case. The toxicology reports reveal that Brenda and Mark both used marijuana and methamphetamine in the hours before they were killed. Are there any violent drug gangs who would do a crime like this if they were owed a debt that wasn't being repaid? Could it be somebody that happened upon the house who was high on drugs, taking uh, drugs and unleashed a lot of violence on the family so quick that they couldn't do anything about it at all. Scouring their criminal databases for answers, federal agents stumble upon a local skinhead gang that's been breaking into people's homes and robbing them at gunpoint. Well, maybe this, this home invasion group broke into the house, bound the victims, and when they discovered there was no money and there was no drugs, um, decided to take it out on the victims. We were pretty optimistic that we may get something out of, t out of focusing on this particular group. But what we couldn't explain was how did the children factor into this? Everything else looked good, but when we got back to the children, they were an anomaly that could not be explained. The FBI consults its narcotics informants to find out if there's been any talk of the murders in drug circles. But the lead quickly goes cold. And after several weeks, authorities are still no closer to making sense of the crime. We brought the FBI profilers in because we were at a loss. We have a situation where the children are gone and a family is murdered. Therefore, does this fit with any known profile of any criminal that you guys know out there? We brought them from two different units. One unit that dealt with serial killers and one unit that dealt with child abductions. But even the top behavior analysts in the country are stymied by the puzzle. Very quickly, they, they, they told us there's a, there's a lot here that doesn't make sense. There's a lot of here that isn't typical of, of these type crimes, and, and that's, that's their expertise. We could find similar crimes when it came to our bludgeoned murder victims. We could find similar crimes when it came to the abduction of our children. But when you put the two together, we, we couldn't find anything. Why would you just not murder the entire family? And so we, we kept coming up with all these theories as to why someone would take two children from the house. Was it to hold them for ransom? Was it to sell them into slavery? The one thing they left us with, though, is the key to solving this crime is answering the question, what happened to the children? If you can find out why the children were taken, then you will solve the crime. It's been almost two weeks since Dylan and Shasta Groney vanished in the dead of the night. And the task force is no closer to figuring out what happened to them or why their family was murdered. Yeah, I had I hope so that they were alive. I just didn't know whether I would ever see them again in my lifetime. My one thought was, my God, I hope they're alive. But. As time went by, it got worse and worse, where I, I was more and more sure that something had happened to him. By the end of May, there are 150 federal, state, and local investigators toiling around the clock and working every angle. I was running on very little sleep, uh, as was most all the investigators in the case. I don't think many of us slept any more than a couple of hours a day for probably the first 10 days of the investigation. 
Two more weeks go by, and despite the heavy news coverage, the case is going nowhere. Until a local woman comes forward with a promising new lead. On the night that Dylan and Shasta's family was murdered, she was traveling between Coeur d'Alene and Spokane sometime after 2 a.m. She told us that she saw the vehicle, a dark colored vehicle. She believed it was a Lincoln, a pull off on the highway just to the east side of the crime scene. She believed she saw three male adults in that car. She called that in because she thought possibly that car may have been uh, involved in the crime. At first, the lead doesn't seem very promising until investigators discover that the spot where the three men pulled over is less than a mile from the home where Brenda Groney, Slade Groney, and Mark McKenzie had just been bludgeoned to death. Uh, shortly afterwards, we received another informant. Uh, that particular informant uh, came forward anonymously, and he felt that his uh, associates uh, had been involved in something very serious. He thought that he overheard them talking about possibly placing some bodies in some abandoned mine shafts over in the Silver Valley. The tipster gives the names Mike Hardwell, Ray Nando, and Ben Westerly. Detectives soon learn that two of the men have a criminal record, and another striking detail rises to the surface. We found that they drove a car very similar uh, in description to the one that the uh, lady had called in previously. Uh, when we did some analysis of their cell phone activity, we noticed that there was indeed some cell phone activity in the area of the crime scene on or about uh, the time of, of the crime. After almost two months of fruitless searching, it seems the task force is finally closing in on a viable lead. But just as they're setting up surveillance on their suspects, the case takes a stunning turn. When the phone rang at 2 o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning, I wasn't quite prepared for what I was going to hear. I couldn't believe it. I refused to believe it at first and even said, you have got to be kidding me. FBI agents are quickly brought up to speed on a local waitress who has a shocking story to tell. I had just come back from my break. I automatically checked my section and I had noticed um, two new people in my section. I get a clear view of the little girl. It was an in instantaneous, oh, oh my God, is that Shasta? She remained um, with her head down. Her, an her hands were in a prayer position, stuck between her legs. Her whole body language just screamed, help me. Hey, how are you guys doing tonight? But the waitress doesn't miss a beat. She takes their orders, then sneaks to the back of the restaurant and tells her manager to call 911. I saw the squad car pull up. I walked out, and as soon as the officer stepped out of his vehicle, I told him he was going to need to call for backup. I was positive it was her, and he was going to need more help. When backup arrives, the police cautiously enter the restaurant and escort the man, without incident, to their squad car. The officer had grabbed my elbow, and all he said was, stay with her. I said, honey, what's your name? And she said, Shasta Groney, and she just started bawling. When we first got the call that Shasta was found, I was elated, I, I was ecstatic. Although we had so many questions, who was this person that, that Shasta was found with? Where has she been this entire time? Was this a person that just found her wandering on the street? Was she, was she dropped off? Uh, it, it, it was unbelievable. And, and of course, all of us wanted to know, where was Dylan? Shasta's rushed to the hospital for evaluation. And after a harrowing two months, Steve Groney is reunited with his daughter. Gonna, you know, laid my head on the pillow next to her and was, she eventually kind of opened her eyes and said, Daddy, and gave me a big hug. At the command center, investigators interrogate her companion. He is identified as 42-year-old Joseph Edward Duncan III from Fargo, North Dakota. 
I thoroughly expected uh, to find that this was going to be one of the many, many names that we had dealt with in the investigation. And when he told me the name, Joseph Edward Duncan III, I was perplexed. I had never heard that name. And I can recall saying, who? We start doing all our record and database checks, and we come to find very quickly that he's a level three sex offender who is um, out, a fugitive from a molestation case back in Minnesota. Level three sex offenders pose a potential high risk to the community because of their history of sexual assaults. In fact, Duncan's first recorded sex crime occurred in 1978 when he was just 15 years old. Two years later, he was sentenced to a Kansas City prison for molesting a teenage boy. There he was diagnosed as a sexual psychopath and underwent years of intensive psychological evaluation. On the surface, he seemed to be showing signs of reform until 2004 when he was charged with sexually molesting a six-year-old boy at a playground in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. But Duncan was not ready to go back to jail. He managed to borrow $15,000 for his bail and immediately left town. He had a web page where he wrote extensively about society's persecution of sex offenders. He knew he was going back to prison for the molestation in, in Minnesota and uh, he made a decision. He decided I can either stay here, try and fight the case and risk going to prison, or I can go on the run, take whatever money I have, and I can live out my ultimate fantasy. That was his goal. His final blog entry, written just before the murders, is especially menacing. In it, he rants about striking out at society. But Duncan's motives no longer interest investigators. Their sole concern now is the whereabouts of Dylan Groney. I did make an attempt at uh, interviewing Mr. Duncan. Uh, however, Mr. Duncan invoked his uh, Fifth Amendment right to silence. Determined to find Dylan, investigators search Duncan's vehicle and discover a treasure trove of evidence. The shotgun, Duncan's laptop computer, his GPS device, uh, an empty package that uh, the plastic zip ties had been in. A key piece of evidence was a, a small microdrive, a four gigabyte microdrive, that um, contained a lot of um, still images and video images of the children while they were in captivity. And so the investigation uh, then ramped up tenfold in an effort and in a belief that Dylan may still be alive. But they're unable to find the murder weapon or anything that might lead them to the missing boy. And I still had hopes that they were going to find Dylan alive somewhere. Running out of options, police turn to the only other person who may have information on Dylan's whereabouts, his sister Shasta. We assigned an investigator to conduct interviews with Shasta to get the full story from her to try to assess whether or not she had actual knowledge or not. The little girl begins to tell her story and it's a tale more haunting than anything the seasoned investigators have heard before. I can only imagine what those children went through. Police in Idaho have finally rescued eight-year-old Shasta Groney from her abductor fugitive sex offender Joseph Edward Duncan III. When I heard Shasta had been found, I just cried. And I just thought, thank God, thank God. And then a second later, I thought, where's Dylan? It was hard to be happy and elated about it because now I understand that they don't know where Dylan is still. So it, uh, boy, just emotionally, man, it was a roller coaster. As federal agents search Duncan's laptop and GPS for leads on the missing boy, Shasta tells investigators her story. On the night of the murders, the little girl awakens to the sound of her mother's voice calling her and Dylan to the living room. 
There, she sees Joseph Duncan standing over Brenda, Slade, and Mark with a shotgun. Oh, he removed the two children, Shasta and Dylan, from the home and laid them in the grass out on the back of the house. He did not want Shasta and Dylan to see what he intended to do to their family. When he's done, Duncan drives the children 95 miles away to a campground outside the town of St. Regis, Montana. Once there, he proceeds to sexually assault both of them. The children must have felt absolutely helpless and alone out at these campsites. Uh, they're in the middle of nowhere. They saw no other humans, no other vehicles. Uh, you don't even hear of the presence of man out here. So they literally must have thought they were at the ends of the earth. My first law was out and I killed this guy. I had a lot of spiritual help from the people. Six weeks into the children's captivity, Duncan takes Dylan into an abandoned cabin where he tortures and molests him. A few hours later, Duncan shoots Dylan in the head in front of Shasta and burns his body. I thought to myself, it, it was shocking. And I thought, what a monster this guy was. To know that there's, there's people out there that can inflict this type of pain on a child, it shakes your whole foundation of beliefs. And it, it's just, it's overwhelming. Duncan then tells Shasta that he spared her life because she taught him how to love. Oh, I don't believe for a minute that he was planning to let Shasta live. And she was lucky. The next day, using data from Duncan's GPS and laptop, investigators locate the campsite where Shasta says her brother was murdered. Searching the area on their hands and knees, bureau agents soon find what they're looking for a fragment of bone and at a nearby culvert more bone fragments when they told me they had conclusive evidence that Dylan had been murdered I I pretty much lost it and that just broke my heart you know Dylan was such a, a loving uh, and tender hearted kid and uh, eventually find out all the things that he went through during that period of time that, that was hard to take when investigators confront Duncan with all the evidence against him he finally confesses he wanted society to know how bad he was he wanted to make sure that, that society was harmed or injured by what he had done he had two goals. His goal, again, was to live out what he thought his ultimate fantasy was, which apparently involved murdering and assaulting children, and to exact revenge on society. Revenge against what he thought society had done to him as a registered sex offender. Duncan goes on to tell authorities how he prepared extensively for his crime. He starting uh, before he ever even left North Dakota. He started assembling equipment and items that he would need. Heading west, Duncan goes hunting for targets. Once he reaches Idaho, by sheer chance, he comes across the Grony home. As he comes down this hill, one of the first homes, he sees staffs the playing in the front yard and surveils the house. He spots Dylan. So he spends the next day and a half or so uh, checking out the house. He had brought the weapon of his choice uh, to kill the family with, and that was a hammer. He had thought about everything to make sure that he was going to commit the perfect crime. In the early morning hours of May 16th, Duncan decides it's time to make his move. He enters through an unlocked back door and finds Brenda asleep in the living room. 
He trained the weapon on her and he said, where's the man? He instructed Brenda to wake Mark up. And he instructed Brenda to put the zip ties onto Mark. He wanted them to believe that this is just a burglary. He felt that was a better choice than to let them know that his intent was to truly take the young children. He thought if he told them that, they would fight to the death. Once everyone is bound and gagged, Duncan takes Dylan and Shasta outside so they won't witness the deaths of their family members. He wants them to go with him quietly. The rest of Duncan's story tracks with Shasta's account. But one aspect remains unclear. Why he ultimately returned with the little girl to Coeur d'Alene. Some people think that he took her there because he wanted to be captured. Some people believe that he took her there um, because he was out of money. My personal belief is that it was Shasta that brought Duncan back to us because Shasta was able to befriend Duncan and that allowed her to survive the whole ordeal. On October 16, 2006, Duncan pleads guilty to three counts of kidnapping and three counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of Mark McKenzie, Brenda Groney, and Slade Groney. He receives six life sentences. Then, on December 3rd, 2007, Duncan pleads guilty to 10 federal charges in connection to the kidnapping and sexual abuse of Dylan and Shasta and the murder of Dylan. I was not surprised that Duncan pleaded guilty. I think he's a coward. I don't think he wanted to get up on the stand and have to, to testify. And I was so pleased that he, he had pleaded guilty so that we wouldn't have to go through the hell of going to court every day and seeing this man. Almost three years after the horrific crimes in Coeur d'Alene, Duncan receives three additional life terms, plus three death penalties, and is sent to the Terre Haute Federal Prison in Indiana to await execution. Joseph Duncan is the personification of evil. He's, he's the boogeyman. He's everybody that we should and need to fear. Today, the McKenzies and the Gronies do their best to move on from the tragedy and always keep the memories of their loved ones close. I talked to Mark on the phone a couple of days before this, this terrible thing happened. And thank God I had told Mark that I loved him and he had told me he loved me back. And that's the last time I spoke to him. Jasmine is uh, 12 years old now. It's amazing that she acts just like any other kid her age. Yeah, my uh, son Jesse, he's 22 now. He had his uh, first kid uh, back in February of 07. They named him Dylan Slade, Stephen Groney, which uh, 